Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. John Duyard, and welcome to today's Lifestyle Podcast. Today, I have a really special guest. She's the author of a book called The New Ayurveda Kitchen, What You Eat for How You Feel. Her name is Divya Alter. She's the owner of a phenomenally successful Ayurvedic restaurant in Manhattan in New York. She's a special, special guest. She has so much wisdom to share with us today about Ayurvedic cooking and Ayurvedic lifestyle. Uh, I just can't wait to dive in here. Let me just tell you a little bit about her. She's a certified nutritional consultant educator for the Shakyavansiya Ayurvedic tradition. She's the co-founder of the Bhagavad Life the only Ayurvedic culinary school in New York where you can actually go and learn how to be an Ayurvedic chef. She and her husband, Prentice, launched North America's first Ayurvedic chef certification program and Divya's Kitchen, her restaurant, an Ayurvedic restaurant in Manhattan. Divya is the author of What to Eat for How You Feel, the new Ayurvedic kitchen. Uh, that book is in its sixth printing, uh, soon to be printed in Germany. She's got another book on the way, a new cookbook, uh, which the working title is Ayurveda's Guide to Cooking by Ingredients. So for example, if you have some broccoli in your refrigerator and you need to eat it quickly because it's going to go bad, you can look up broccoli and then you can find all these amazing recipes, Ayurvedic recipes, what to do with that broccoli, how to make it, um, how to make it taste fantastic. And, and, and in her first book, you know, how to eat for how to what it how to, how you feel like that's what it's really all about is that when you eat food it should make you feel really good and that's one of the the premises of Ayurveda and Divya welcome to our podcast thank you so much I, I really appreciate you um, you being with us um, I want to share just a quick story before I I I I, uh, I recently um, my son uh, got married. Uh, a couple of in early in mid January, and uh, he uh, married a, a, a girl from uh, Wales, and they he filed for a fiance visa, and he got it. He didn't think he would, so he could because he she couldn't come to the U.S. anymore, and uh, they gave him the visa, and they said you have to be married in six weeks. Boom, you have to get married to make this whole visa thing work because you marry someone from outside the country. So we did this crash wedding in New York, and. We had the the uh, the ceremony, not the ceremony, but the the the, the dinner at Divya's Kitchen, and it was nothing short of fantastic. If you are ever in New York, and you're in Manhattan, you have to go to Divya's Kitchen. There's just no other way to talk about it. I have friends of mine who told me about Divya's Kitchen. People have digestive problems, and one guy told me it's the only restaurant that he can eat at. The only because other restaurant any restaurant he just feels terrible. It's the only restaurant in the world that he can go to that he can actually feels good eating. So her book, What to Eat for How You Feel, is really real. She's brilliant. Divya, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. John. It's wonderful, wonderful to have you, and I'm super honored and very happy to be with you to see you again. Thank you so much for having me. Well, the honor is really, truly mine, and I'm, I'm really grateful for you to be here. And, and, and of course, the, you know, the elephant in the room is your restaurant's been closed for a month, you know, with coronavirus. You know, I think everybody would like to just hear, how has that been for you, and how has that been for the restaurant and your staff and employees? I mean, tell us a little bit about what you've been through. Yes, we, we closed exactly a month ago, and it was just we felt this would be the safest options option for our staff because they had to travel by subway and be with a lot of people before and after they come to work. So um, we've been living at home and working from home. And on a personal level, honestly, it's been really nice because we, my husband and I, my husband Prentice and I, we could finally have some, extra time for ourselves and for self-care and really rest more. We were so exhausted. We realized how exhausted we were. <laughs> and uh, yes, more time for reading, more time for writing, more time for all the things that we didn't have time for. Prayer, meditation, all, all these things. And also we have a rooftop in our apartment so we can go up and see get some sun every day without, while well, still practicing distancing. Mm. So we're okay, our health is better, getting better, we're stronger. 
from a business point of view, it's a real, real struggle, but the whole city is going through this. So we are, we're just trying to hang in there and try to maybe find, we're looking into creative ways to continue to serve in this situation. So this whole downtime is allowing us to really realign, connect with our core values and who we are, what we meant to do, and then find new ways to do it and serve people. Yeah, I mean, I think that's obviously the, the only way to really look at it and to make it into, to find the silver lining. I think we all have found the silver lining in some way, shape or form um, through this whole, whole journey, but I, I couldn't imagine um, being in your shoes and having your livelihood to be shut down, all your employees. And, I, and uh, you know, we talked off air, you'd mentioned that you know, the government support for restaurants isn't actually, they don't, they don't, they're not sending money. They, they, they give you opportunity to take loans out, which is, I thought this whole stimulus package, this trillions of dollars they keep talking about, I thought some of it would go to folks like you and to your employers, but I guess that's actually not what's really happening, right? Well, there are different options for loans and grants. Our accounting team is helping us find the best options for us. Um, it's not as easy as it sounds. <laughs> so yeah. We've applied and we're still waiting. It's, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a scary situation because like we, we worked on this project for years and all of a sudden it's closed. So we're like, all right what to do so we're uh, we're moving more into we're thinking of creating more um, culinary products that help you cook at home are you very culinary products we're working on that right now we're working on more um, online education supporting our community in cooking Ayurvedic at home and yes we yeah well i think that you know you <clears throat> teaching and certifying people how to cook. And I think that's brilliant. And, and, and that I think is going to be such a great service for folks. You know, the Divya's Kitchen in New York, when we were there, it was a, I don't know what it was, Tuesday night or something like that it was. And it was packed and it wasn't a special weekend or a holiday. It was the middle of January and it was just packed to the gill. So her restaurant you know, was just an incredible success, right? I mean, you must, you must have been so, um, I don't know, proud or, or so thrilled by the success and mostly that people were loving what you were doing so much. Yes, yes, for sure. Thrilled and, and also very grateful for all, all the support. This is, this is a teamwork. It's yeah. not just me, it's not just my husband. It's, it's a team of dedicated people who are really passionate about doing this, not, not just as a business, but also as a service. And, mm. and seeing the positive effects that uh, our food has on people um, and their families, it, it's been very inspiring for us. So we so keep one, So one of the things that you do at Divya's Kitchen, which is phenomenal, is you make everything from scratch. Um, yes. I think you mentioned to me when I was there that I forget what it was. It was the, the, first of all, you make your own ghee, right? Mm -hmm. But you also, um, you churn your own, do you churn your own butter too? Yes. So we start, um, we make cultured ghee. So right. we do it in the traditional Ayurvedic way. I take organic grass fed heavy cream and I culture right. it. It becomes like a thick sour cream. And then we churn it. I have a machine and then we, we churn that. Uh, cultured cream into fresh cultured butter and when you do that the the byproduct is fresh buttermilk which is so rich in friendly bacteria and also to culture the cream i use the natron uh, probiotic yogurt starter it's a much higher uh, friendly bacteria yogurt starter so um and then we churn it and then we have the fresh buttermilk which is which I love drinking, make like little lassi, digestive lassi, or we use it also as a, as a replacement for egg replacer for baking. 
And then we take this freshly churned butter, which is just so amazing. Just squeezing the buttermilk out of it is such an experience by itself. And then we cook this very slowly into ghee. And I usually play the Mahamrityunjaya mantra or other healing Ayurvedic mantras in the background, just to infuse also even more healing potency into it. That's one thing, we do this once a week. <laughs> and how long does that take you to make to make the, the, the ghee, to churn the butter and to make the ghee? How long is that process? It's a three day process. Well, I usually make six gallons at a time, which is a lot, but that's how much we need for the week. And um, the first day we culture, it takes, or it cultures overnight, and then we chill it for a day, for a day and then we churn it, it takes a couple of hours to churn it. And then it takes about eight to 10 hours to cook it because we cook it in very low heat. So it's, it, it's a three day process. Is there, is there any other restaurant that you know of that actually makes their own ghee from scratch, makes their own butter from scratch, makes their own buttermilk from scratch? Not that I heard of. I mean, Dr. John, you have to understand ghee, even if you just buy the ghee, that's not cultured and not organic and whatever. Uh, it's, it's a very expensive ingredient. It's a very expensive oil to cook with. So very few restaurants use it and very few restaurants use it for, they, they maybe, if they use it, they maybe use it for one or two dishes. But most restaurants use canola oil. That's the standard cooking oil uh, because it's a neutral oil, it's a high heat oil. But we don't use canola oils. <laughs> so you have to understand that that this is why this is why Divya's kitchen is so special. You know, every restaurant uses the cheapest basically oil they can find for cooking. If you go to an Italian restaurant and they give you a bottle of olive oil for your bread, 99% of the time it's adulterated with something else, sunflower oil plus a little olive oil to give it some taste. There are no Indian restaurants that use ghee. To cook with. They just don't exist. They all use the cheapest oil, which makes me really sad because Indian food can be really good, but we use the cheapest oil. And I've written articles and articles and articles about how that oil is so cheap and so highly processed that, that they bleach and boil and deodorize it to such an extent that no, nothing exists in those cooking oils. And then they put it in a loaf of bread and loaf of bread stays squishy on the shelf for a month. The bugs on the counter won't eat it. When you eat the bread, the bugs won't eat that oil inside of you either. So where do all that bad oil go? That's in every restaurant that you go to, unless you choose from the menu carefully, it goes right to your liver, congests your liver. Number one, one, number one abdominal surgery in America today is having your gallbladder removed. So when you go to a place like Divya's Kitchen and everything, not just the ghee, we're gonna to get to it, everything's made from scratch. You're talking about the most, you know, the most highly, Pranad, you know, sattvic, nourishing, ojas building food, and you can feel it and you can taste it. We had, I don't know, we had like 14, 15, 16 people in our party or something like that. Um, <clears throat> and all I could hear was like all these oohs and ahs when people were eating this food and it was served with such love. What you've created is phenomenal. So you got to understand how rare it is to go to an Indian, it's not even an Indian restaurant, it's an Ayurvedic restaurant that actually um, has such a diverse menu that, that I mean, you can eat, there's vegan, there's gluten-free, and it's all phenomenally, it's all gourmet, and it's all, um, and it's all cooked with Ayurvedic principles. There's Ayurvedic lasagna that she has, which is off the charts. So it's using the Ayurvedic principles to feed American, the, the, the American culture. And, and, and of course, there's Indian dishes that are very Ayurvedic Indian as well. And that's what I love and what I was so taken by Divya is that, you know, what I try to do is take Ayurvedic medicine and translate it into English for folks so people can understand this incredible wisdom with modern science and then, you know, then live a life that, that is not, you know, from 3,000 years ago, but actually live a life in a modern way, but using the principles that are time tested for 3,000 years ago with the modern science to give us the ability to, to really thrive in our life and our lifestyle. And that's exactly what Divya has done in her kitchen. She has foods that, right? You have a completely diverse menu. It was really phenomenal to see. I was really surprised to see that. So tell us more about some of the things you make from scratch. 
Well, wait, or anything you want to say. There, I just want to follow up on what you just said because I have to give you credit for my creativity as well and, and my understanding because I learned from you so much. You're just an unlimited reservoir of knowledge. You just, I don't know how you get all this and you're a very expert translator of the ayurvedic knowledge just making it really accessible to the modern mind and um, that's my passion also is how to ayurveda is a universal science it you can apply it anywhere in the world you don't have to eat indian food to be ayurvedic you know and also you go to italy you cannot feed them indian food <laughs> if you want to present ayurveda you have to you have to adapt local recipes to the Ayurvedic principles. So that's my passion. It's, you apply it more in the treatment and the medicinal part of Ayurveda. And I like to apply it in the diet because a lot of patients, and I, I'm, I've been one of those people, like when I first started being treated by Ayurvedic doctors, I didn't know how to eat Ayurveda. I didn't know. I, I got all the remedies and the herbs and the protocol. And then I went home and I'm like, thank God I was a trained chef, but I, I didn't know I was uh, the spices. Am I doing this right? Um, the heat for cooking, all these things. So I, I like to make this, the food part, I really like to make it more accessible to people because you can apply it anywhere of the world, in the world for any kind of age, any body type, any issue. Uh, and it's actually not difficult. <laughs> You know, that's exactly what I want to get into. I, I, went, I went to the Soviet Union many years ago in the early 1990s and, and went there with some Ayurvedic people and I taught there. And um, the Ayurvedic doctors were telling the people in Russia to not eat potatoes. And um, <laughs> it just didn't go very well at all because that's all they had. It was really at the time when the Soviet Union was breaking up and they had no food. And, you know, so it, what you're saying is so true. And, and when I was in India, my, one of my favorite teachers told me, he goes, this is not Indian medicine. This is universal. And you need to teach it as universal medicine and not teach it as Indian medicine. And, you know, that was one of, one of, um, one of the reasons why I, I sort of do what I do, because I, I was taught to look at it in a global way, not in a, in a you know, a national kind of way. So tell us a little bit more about that. What are some of the basic principles that people can take away and say, okay, this is Ayurvedic cooking. Here's how I get started. Here are some basic things that I can do like today or tomorrow. Okay, well, what makes a dish Ayurvedic or what makes you cooking Ayurvedic? So there are two main tracks that my teacher, uh, Vaidya Ramakant Mishra, he always brought this up when he spoke about cooking. So number one is... Uh, the right ingredients and combining them properly. So in in Sanskrit, this is called sang yoga. So yoga means to link together. So um, finding the best ingredients, the best quality ingredients, and also the the ingredients that are right for you, uh, for your own needs, for balance, and then combining them properly for best digestion. So. One thing that really inspires me about Ayurveda that I haven't found anywhere else, maybe a little bit in Chinese medicine, but it's the knowledge of food compatibility for digestion. So what makes two foods can be really great on their own and great for you, but when you combine them, they start fighting in the stomach. So why is that? Because sometimes there is a chemical reaction that causes indigestion. Sometimes the two foods become too heavy to digest or they interact with different types of digestive strength and then there is a reaction. <clears throat> so some yoga is how to find the, best, the right ingredients, best quality and combine them properly. And then is um, sanskara. So that's the, um, the proper preparation. So how to um, cook it in a way to protect the prana, the life force in the food and also make it really tasty. So these are like, this is what makes it Ayurvedic really. And you always, so the, an Ayurvedic cook would always be mindful about digestion. Is this, is this gonna help boost my digestion or is it going to make it more harder for me to digest? Okay, so 
Um, I love that, that it's really, the thought is not just to make it taste good. Like you said in your title of your book, is how to, how to make you feel good. And in your book, you make it very clear what foods go together and how to combine them. It's really clear and really beautiful, beautifully written. But give us some tips. Give us some hot tips of some basic things that people can go, oh, this is how I would put this together to support the prana, to support the digestion, and to make it compatible. Well, in terms of food compatibility, for example, you know, when I, I lived in India for five years and when I was in India, common breakfast was in the morning, like fruit with yogurt mixed together. And I always felt very, I always felt like I needed to take a nap afterwards and I couldn't understand why. Uh, but then I realized when I started learning about Ayurveda, it was like, oh, wow, well, fresh yogurt and fruit, when you eat them together, it's really heavy for the digestive system and it's incompatible because of that. Why? Because the, because the yogurt is a very heavy food. Right. Also, this dish is very cold. It's, it's refrigerated, it's served cold, so it doesn't go bad. So it, it's very heavy, very nutritious, but also heavy to digest food. It's rich in fat and it just it can congest you easily. And then fruit, um, they also... I, I mean, you're the doctor and the expert, but my understanding is that there are different digestive enzymes that help you break these two foods. So it, they kind of start fighting in the stomach. And um, I always felt like very heavy after I eat this fruit salad. And I'm like, okay, now I know why. It, it's just, it's too difficult for the, for the stomach to break all this down at the same time. So that's one, and I know a lot of Western people, it's just such a common thing to mix fruit and yogurt together. And you sell it, they sell it in the stores and, and all that. So that, especially most people, they like Greek yogurt, which is so processed and fat-free and even harder to digest because it's so thick and creamy and oh, so yummy. But oh, it just sits there for a long time, you know? And then you you congested and you don't know why, so so that's that's one thing that I, I it's best to enjoy fruit on itself. So you can make a nice fruit salad and have it as an afternoon snack. I like right. to add a little bit of fresh mint to it. Um, you can add some spices to it also if you like. So is it the fact that that the, you know in, in traditional food combining, which has been around? Here, is it sort of the idea that the fruit is really light and it's sugar, so it, it digests relatively quickly in the yogurt? Mm. Is it got a lot of fat, so it's going to be a slow, a much slower burn and a heavier food to digest? Is it because these foods are being digested at different speeds in your stomach? And, exactly. And, yeah. and then the stomach says, "I got all this fruit. I'm ready to pass it through into the small intestine." But the, but the the, the liver hasn't produced enough bile to be ready for the for the fat in the, in the yogurt. So we end up with this food sitting in your stomach and fermenting in your stomach because it's all broken down and, and now we have a lot of gas being produced in the stomach and uh, that can make you feel bloated and heavy and that kind of thing. Is, is, is that the, the basic reason? Yeah, you explained it very well, yeah. But uh, it's just, there. so there are two types of incompatibility, one creates a real chemical reaction that, that can be like slow food poisoning. For right. example, drinking milk and orange juice together. <laughs> you know? And sometimes I think of a typical American breakfast and it's like, okay, let's take the cereal and let's pour cold milk from the fridge and orange juice on the side and let's sprinkle some fresh berries to make it more nutritious. And you eat this as a kid. Uh, and at once and it, then it, it's like I mean I would get diarrhea I don't know how other <laughs> people would react but but it just said uh, and then kids eat like that from an early age and that they develop such allergies also from because the body is like don't give me this anymore so this, yeah, this you, one, you, you put it that way right you know the thought of just a glass of orange juice and a glass of milk together, if you did one after another, it just really makes no sense. Just anybody with a logical mind would go, these really don't go together, you know? Yeah. Um, but we, we do a bang up job making it fit. 
or a strawberry milkshake, you know, with all the heavy cream on top is the same thing because milk is sweet by nature. When you add anything acid, anything acidic, anything sour to it, it curdles. So right. it doesn't curdle while you're preparing it, it will curdle in your stomach. Ooh, yeah. So, so while we're on the subject of fruit, you know, it's, this is like the big, you know, Ayurvedic question, right? Is fruit supposed to be eaten alone? Um, and, um, you know, I get a lot of pushback regularly um, on that. And I'm curious what your take is on that. And what's the story around fruit and what kind of fruits have to be alone and what kind of fruits are sort of okay to have them with other things and what would they be? Yeah, well... You might, you might say that fruit is light because it's fresh and doesn't, most fruit don't really have a lot of fat and protein that the heavy nutrients. But fruit is also heavy in the sense that it has a lot of water and sugar, like, like these are heavy elements also. So uh, for some people, fruit can be heavy to digest. So for example, the melons, like watermelon, um, yeah honey melon, like all these melon family, they have a lot of water and a lot of sugar, very heavy elements. Yeah. So, um, they are, ideally, they should be eaten alone. Yeah. Um, and they can be very refreshing. Actually, if, if you need like in the summer, and it should be seasonal, also, <laughs> don't eat watermelon in the winter, you know. <laughs> but in the summer, fresh watermelon, oh, it's so refreshing and hydrating, it's energizing. Um, and then if you eat it, some people like to eat watermelon with cheese. And really? it's, yeah, yeah, in Bulgaria, watermelon and feta cheese. It's like, I'm from Bulgaria, so this is like a, this is like a wow. snack people have. And I'm like, oh, I used to do it. Um, and then according to the Shakavansia tradition, uh, there are two fruits that you can eat raw with other food. One is ripe papaya. And the other one is pineapple. Right. So they're both very rich in digestive enzymes. And they're, they're, they support, like, if you eat them, let's, ideally with lunch, not so much dinner. Um, but if you eat them with lunch, then they will support uh, your digestion. I, I don't, I cannot really, my teeth are too sensitive to eat a pineapple, but I would make fresh pineapple juice and sometimes... I'll have that with my lunch. So in your restaurant, the only, you don't mix any fruits with anything else except papaya and pineapple with other things. We don't really use papaya. We use fresh pineapple juice and we make hibiscus pineapple drink, which is amazing for your digestion. It, um, nice. So that's, that's all of our fresh drinks that we use fresh juices, they're the digestive drinks. Like we have ginger mint lime made with the fresh juices of ginger, mint, and lime. Really good for your digestion. Mm. Uh, I don't use, really, what, what other fruits do we use? We, let me think. We would use a cooked apple. See, it, there's also a difference between cooked and raw fruit. So uh -huh. cooked fruit is much easier. Like there are a lot of cooked, like apple chutney or grape chutney or mango chutney, you know, these are, and they're used as digestive side dishes, not in our menu, but in general. So, That's a great question, the apples, the difference between cooked apples and a raw apple, what's the difference? Well, cooked apple is much, it's more grounding. Uh, it's much easier to process. Uh, the raw apple, it's, um, it's more astringent and it can cause more gas, especially if you're more airy type, more vata, or you have vata imbalance. So my teacher, Vaidya Mishra, he always recommended, uh, well, not always, but he recommended to eat a cooked apple as a pre-breakfast in the morning. You know, when you wake up and your whole body is waking up, your digestion is waking up, and the cooked apple is kind of like turning your digestive fire up. And uh, it also stimulates the um, elimination system so you can hopefully get your bowel movement going as well, but it's just such a, I love having the cooked apple in the morning. It's very simple, just one apple, peel it, add too close to it, and cook it in a little bit of water for takes five minutes. But it just settles everything in your stomach and it turns your digestive fire up. Also, for some people who are very fiery, 
they wake up and they're like on fire. They want to, the, the fire is too high, too high pitta. Then the apple will calm that down. So if you want to work out or meditate without, um, without having your breakfast first, then the apple will kind of settle everything. You can actually concentrate better. And then You're talking about that's a that's a raw apple in that case, right? The, cook, the cooked apple, yeah. Oh, the cooked apple. Like I find for myself, I find raw apple easier to digest in the afternoon, for me, and the cooked right. apple is easier for me in the morning. Right. So in in sometimes one of the exceptions that I use is that having I love cooked apples. I think they're great, and I think they're a great way, particularly for vata and, and weaker digestion. But if you have relatively strong digestion. Apples and other fruits like papaya, of course, and strawberry and pineapple, because of the digestive enzymes that exist in them naturally, um, apples um, after a meal can be a, uh, you know, the, 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 the pectin in the apple and the fiber in the apple um, can be like an intestinal scrub to kind of clean your intestinal tract. And uh, of course, gives you a lot of fiber and helps you move your bowels. There's blood sugar stabilizing properties in the skin of the apple um, that make it really complete when you eat the, the whole thing. And, and uh, so that's one of the exceptions that I do make um, because it actually um, seems to support healthier digestion. And it's, and it's traditional around the world, in Europe, in Italy, in Mexico, to have an apple after your meal. Um, even, in, even in parts of India, apples were considered to be, you know, okay. You know, in India, as you know, um, wherever you go, north, south, east, or west, you're going to have different rules based on different geographies. And that's what's beautiful yeah. about Ayurveda is that everything's based on the local environment and the local climate and the local what's growing. Um, so, um, but, you know, it's an it's a interesting thing, you know, because people say, well, God, when do I eat fruit? I, if I eat three meals a day, I'm not supposed to snack. When do I ever eat fruit, right? Which is an interesting question um, for folks. But I think when you get really good digestion, you can make fruit a meal, you know, melons for, for, you know, for a meal in the summertime uh, or, uh, you know, would be something that you can tolerate. But a lot of folks can't make energy last from a, a small meal. They have the over, you know, overwhelming amounts of food. And therefore we overeat, which is a big issue in America, which is why calorie restriction is Nobel Prize winning science. And if we would just stop eating so much, we would start burning fat as a natural source of fuel and we would be able to make energy last from one meal to the next and not have to eat so much. And then a little bowl of fruit would be fine from breakfast to lunch. And you can, you can make that trip on much less fuel, which is so good for our longevity and our planet. In fact. Yeah. yeah. Well, see, it's also like, it's, it's the question of listening to our bodies and really like when you eat, like if you actually eat, carefully like mindfully you will notice when it's time for you to stop eating you know when you're satiated and nourished and so listening to, to our body is really important to to connect and make decisions in relation to food and also honestly my philosophy with health is whatever works you know if eating an apple after your lunch works for you that's great you know if it doesn't work for you try something else <laughs> so right. so and then and also sometimes it works for us for a certain period of time and then we need to shift we need to make changes because it's not it's not supporting us anymore so yeah that brings us up to something else which i think when you cook everything so beautifully and so, and from scratch the way you do um you know a lot of us americans um eat really fast. I mean, you know, just inhale. And I can do that. I can eat, inhale my food really fast. And we just did our big Colorado cleanse. And I actually did um, our, we have a Kaya Kalpa cleanse, which is very, very small amount of food, kitchery, a ghee in the morning, like 10 teaspoons of ghee in the morning, and then a, well, one and three quarters cup of kitchery for the day. That's all you eat all day long. And I was like, okay, I could have my, I divided that in half. I had two servings of that, which is a very, very small amount of food. And for me, like as soon as I start eating, I get hungry. Like it's all of a sudden, you know, by the time I finish that cup, I'm like just getting going, you know, like I'm just, just like, okay, now I'm actually really hungry. A minute ago before I started eating is I wasn't hungry at all. And what I learned to, to, to do with this Kaya Kalpa cleanse was to 
really eat as slowly as I possibly could. Yeah. Because that gave time for the food to get to my stomach, to be absorbed, to get to my brain. And then my brain, by the time I got done with my little, you know, three quarters of a cup of kitchery, I was actually satisfied. And we have, my whole family have six kids. My whole family's home. We're all locked down together. And I was the only one eating this food, you know. So I'm eating my little cup of kitchery and they're eating my kids from New York were vegans. They were cooking these vegan feasts and all this food everybody was eating. And, and I was just eating my little three quarters of a cup of kitchery. Um, and the only way I could be sane through this whole thing was to just eat it really, really slow. But I, what I realized by the end of it, uh, if I ate it really slow, um, that I was actually you know, satiated by a very, very small amount. So that's the whole point is that we eat too fast and therefore eat too much. And therefore we think we eat, need more. But if we could just slow down um, uh, and, and one of the techniques that I learned, Divya, was that if you could just chew the food until there's no flavor in it, which is such a logical thing, right? People say chew like 50 times, you put the fork down. I could never do any of that. But if I could just chew it until the flavor's gone, well, then you've, you've, you've digested it in your mouth with your mouth enzymes and everything in such a way that when that food goes to your stomach, it's so pre-digested from the enzymes in your mouth and broken down that you've taken such a load of digestive hardship from your stomach that if you have weak digestion, it's like, like the most logical thing, right? Chew your food, right? And yeah. eat it in a slow enough way. And if you chew it all the way till there's no taste in it, um, you can do that. Anyway, that's my two cents. That's all no, I know about cooking. Tips. Yeah, I can imagine Kitri, one grain at a time. Yeah, pretty much. It was poor torture. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I have to say it was fun. But I, but I, 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 I did it, and I, I was uh, blown away by how great I felt, and and actually how my appetite um, by just doing it, by doing it really slowly and enjoying it, and and I, and I always had to remind myself that I've got a lot of kukta and I want to eat real fast, and I have to always just slow myself down to eat, really enjoy the food. But this was a whole different world when you're eating a three quarters of a cup of something, and that was it, you know. Um, I had a really, like you said, <laughs> grain by grain. Um, so are there any other tips that people can, that you can share with us that are just going to be like, you know, good take home tips for folks to know how they, what they should do or not do in the kitchen? Well, one, one challenge cooking at home is, is the time, you know, like I don't have time. Now, maybe most of us have a lot of time cooking at home because we're just stuck at home right now. And maybe some of you are getting tired of your own cooking. <laughs> but um, You should pick up, buy this book because this book will, will give you a lot to do at home, you know? Yeah, but I'm like, I'm cooking every day is different because I'm writing, on, I'm working on my new books. So I'm testing new recipes all the time. But um, one thing, and also Ayurveda recommends for your digestion, for your health, for getting most energy out of your food, to eat fresh meals, which means avoid leftovers. And this is always the big shock when people hear that. It's like the most difficult thing to follow. It was very difficult for me from the beginning because it's like, why waste time to cook all the time? And why waste food? If I have any extra, why not eat it again? But when I was very sick, I had an autoimmune disease and so much inflammation and pain. And, and I was like, okay, I'm going to try to have fresh meals every day. And it makes such a big difference for me. So I'm like, yeah, this really works. There is a reason behind that. Uh, so it, it is completely possible to incorporate fresh meals and to make time for them. So here are a few tips, like time-saving tips. For example, a lot of the cooking time is in prep, washing the vegetables, chopping, cleaning the grains, soaking things. So you could break your prep, like you can chop the vegetables the night before and cook them the next morning, or you can chop it in the morning, cook them for dinner. Like you can break up the, the prep time. Because a lot of things, especially when making quick meals, the cooking time is not more than half an hour. If, you, if you're not making lasagna or something like that. So um, in, on Sunday, instead of cooking for the whole week, you can, you can do your prep for the whole week. You can make your spice blends, make your ghee, 
uh, chop your vegetables, make almond milk, make fresh paneer cheese if you're using dairy, make yogurt, whatever. And then, and then cooking takes very little time during the week. So in this way, you have fresh meals. I also, I've been using uh, an instant pot a lot lately because it, it just really saves time and um, it's very easy to use, especially for lentil soups. And I don't mm -hmm. like cooking grains and vegetables in it because it's very easy to overcook them, but I make a dal lentil soup in two minutes. And in the meantime, I'm doing something else. <laughs> <laughs> so it's very it's very easy uh, to make some dishes in, in an instant pot or you could cook a kitchen in a slow cooker and low setting overnight and you wake up it's ready um, put it in a thermos take it to work and in this way you have a fresh meal yeah I think so, people who eat kitchen a lot of folks you know or, or beans for that matter they don't cook them long enough and add enough water to really give the beans the ability to just soak up all the water that they can. And that's the weird thing about beans. You, the more water you give them, the more they'll drink, right? Isn't it? This, yes. this, this, it seems to be the strangest thing. Um, but the more that you do cook them, then you, the easier are, they are to digest and the more bioavailable all that nutrition and that protein is going to be for you, right? And the fiber is broken down. So you have, that's going to be available for you as well to all that fiber creates we call butyric acid, which is the number one driver of gut immunity, which is, of course, the- Especially if you cook them with tea. So, right. So yeah, there are, there are ways to shorten your cooking time, to break it up um, and not make it. I also like, especially my new, my new cookbook, I'm including a lot of one pot meals and it doesn't have to be kitschy all the time. It can be, like I have a minestrone soup, which is kind of like Italian kitchen soup kind of thing with, right. with, uh. with the lentil and, and, and barley and vegetables. And uh, it's really nice. And for breakfast, I make a lot of one pot dishes. Like yesterday I made sprouted, a uh, sauteed monk sprouts. So uh, I love a sprouting monk during the spring season. It's very refreshing. and rejuvenating and but they're too too airy for me so I always saute them a little bit with ghee and warming spices and they're such a light and nourishing breakfast a little bit of leafy greens you can put so many things in them um, becomes like a base dish but you would and, take the the sprouts and you would put them in a frying pan and, and cook them with ghee is that what you would do yeah so I would use a little bit of ghee turmeric Actually, on our Instagram, Divis Kitchen NYC Instagram, we just posted a video recipe for how uh, to make it. But heat the right. ghee, add a little bit of turmeric, a little bit of asafoetida. I use pure, very potent asafoetida from uh, pureindianfoods.com. Um, and just a little bit because it helps reduce the airy quality of the sprouts. And yeah. a little bit of salt, olive oil, some water. And I just cook them for 10 minutes, they soften, they become very like succulent. Um, and then I turn off the heat and I add like some arugula just to wilt it, or you can add other greens. So you can add some asparagus, cook it for a couple of minutes, like things like that. And it's so delicious. And it's, when you eat it, it's very filling, but you don't feel heavy at all. Yeah. And it's very high in nutrients, it's high in protein very high in fiber but it just feels so filling and nourishing but you, you you're full of energy that's how i feel when i eat it so um can you tell us how you what your recipe is for real quick how you do your cooked apples yes yeah, so very easy and now the key is to have this recipe like first thing in the morning right because when you when you wake up your digestive fire turn turns on Okay. Um, especially, and as the sun comes up, the, the fire goes up. So do this as soon as you get up in the morning. So what I usually do is I get up in the morning and I wash my face and my mouth and I start the apple. So I, I peel the apple and I cut it into pieces. And while I'm doing this, I'm already boiling the water, just a little bit of water, a small saucepan, like half an inch of water, two cloves, two cloves, whole clove, 
per apple. And then cook the, cover it and simmer it for about five minutes until it's soft. And that's it, cool it down and eat it. I like Wait, to eat it. Just apple and clove, that's it? Yeah, so the clove, I love cloves. Cloves, are, they're pungent spice, the taste of the clove is pungent, but the post-digestive taste is sweet. So clove, the pungency of clove opens up the channels in the body and it helps with congestion and many other things, but um, without overheating. So it will not aggravate your pitta, your fiery energy, if, you're, if you tend to be high pitta. Uh, but it kind of opens everything up, it helps digestion, and then it helps you eat the apple. It's very tasty also. <laughs> So you don't know cinnamon or anything like just the clove. That's you, in that, could, and you, could add, you could add a cinnamon. You can add a cinnamon. And sometimes if I want to make a breakfast out of it, I would add more water and add a few chopped um, dried apricots. I like to use fruit, dry fruit as a sweetener. So the organic unsulfured dried apricots. And then they kind of hydrate in the water. In the meantime, mm -hmm cooking the water, the cutting the apple, and then I add the apple and I would add a little bit of um, quinoa flakes or like a little bit of a grain. Um, it cooks a little longer, but it becomes like a, almost like a, like a, what you call it? Like a porridge kind of thing. And it's mm. very filling. It becomes like a breakfast as well. Wow. Okay. It's That's fantastic. Late. Thank you. That's breakfast. Okay. And can we eat the, um, the mung sprouts? For lunch? You could, yeah. I wouldn't recommend them for dinner because it might make you more gassy if you eat them okay. for dinner. But you could have them as a side dish for lunch as well. Okay. My husband and, and the I... Have, is, go ahead, once. My husband and I, we like to have like a protein-rich breakfast that's savory. We don't like to eat a lot of sweet things for breakfast. So it just, we feel very energized having like something like a savory a protein, yeah. So yeah. that's why we like to have something like that. I think that's great. I think, you know, the American palate is like, I want my eggs and my toast and my, you know, cereal, whatever, oatmeal with, you know, raisins and, it, you know, sort well, of has to be sweet, I you know. <laughs> but I think it's a great transition. I always talk about, you know, breaking the, the sweet taste habit. And I think that's one of the best ways to do it is create something new that's really tasty in a different way and filling in a different way for breakfast. Um, the minestrone soup, I wondered if you could just take us through that because that would be really interesting. Is that, is that a really long process to describe or? No, you... um, no, it's not. It, it's very easy. It's, um, I usually, I like to use, because whole chickpeas, like the regular garbanzo beans, for some people, yeah. it might be too heavy to digest. I like to use chana dal, which is right. the baby black chickpeas split without the skin. It's easier to digest. So I would soak this overnight in boiling hot water. So I, for boiling hot water, soak it overnight. Then it cooks faster and it's much easier to break it down during cooking. So that, that's the, the bean, the lentil. And then I would use whole pearl bar barley. You can also use the, the other barley, the whole barley. It's just, I find it easier, the pearl barley easier to digest. I soak that as well. And then I start cooking the, the chana dal and the, the barley because they take longer to cook than the vegetables. And then in the meantime, I chop vegetables. I like to use celery, carrots, zucchini, I like to use taro root. The taro, I use it instead of potatoes. It has this mucilaginous effect that helps heal the lining of the gut. So I really like using it instead of a potato. And it gives this creamy creaminess to the soup. You have to use a lot of that? No, no. How much? Don't. Well, it depends how much you're making. Let's say you're making for four people. I would use two or three taros. Depends how big they are also. I use the small ones. Okay. Uh, peel them, and and I like to use um, dried herbs, like I would use dried basil, oregano. I like the savory herb. It's a very Bulgarian. It's almost like thyme, uh, or, or you can use dried thyme. So I use that as in the broth, 
and then uh, what else do I use in terms of spices? I use ground coriander, mm. one of my favorite spices. <laughs> and I would I put a little bit of asafoetida simply because it helps digest the lentils. And yeah. then, and it gives a nice flavor, ghee, of course, ghee. And then, then I would add those vegetables maybe when the the grains and the lentils need maybe 15 more minutes to be done. And then I cook those. I don't like to overcook the vegetables, but I cook them always. So whenever I cook, I never cook on high heat. As soon as the soup comes to a boil, I lower the heat, simmer, cover it. And it really, the flavors become, all get together and it becomes very like, everything comes together. So that's a really important principle, right? Is to cook everything in, in, on low heat. It's a very powerful Ayurvedic principle for preserving the prana, right? And, and it also, you don't create any of the acrylamides, which are the toxic chemicals when you overheat things, right? Mm -hmm. So um, can you talk more about that? Like the other reasons why we should cook on low heat? I mean, people just want to cook it and get it going and eat, right? But we really should be well, cooking. Okay. It's good to cover unless you're sauteing. When you saute, you have to cook it uncovered or you're blanching or boiling a bit. In general, if you cover while you're cooking, then it helps uh, for all the flavors to come together. And also it keeps the flavor, the flavors in your pot. <laughs> right, okay. So, um, and, and, then, and then when you, and when you cover, of course you have to lower the heat, otherwise things will start overflowing. Um, but also cooking on low heat creates um, the texture of the vegetables or the grains or, or the lentils that you're using. They all become very soft and oh, when you eat it, it's just, oh, it just melts in your mouth. And I really love that feeling. You, you feel like the dish is giving you a hug, you know, wow. rather than when you cook it on fast on high heat, um, the vegetables are more, I don't know how to describe it, they're more edgy, or the grains, or the lentils. They never become soft like that. So wow. it's beautiful. The food's giving you a hug. Wow, that's special. You know, in your book, one of the things that I thought was really, really cute was, um, you know, this question, um, I'm not sure if it was written as a question, but is, do you have a, um, a spice deficiency? Thought that was really beautiful. Can you talk about that? And how do people know if they have a spice deficiency? Yeah, Vitamisha used to speak about that a lot. And he, you know, we all talk about iron deficiency and vitamin B12 deficiency and whatever deficiency is there. But um, yes, yeah, spice deficiency is very common nowadays because a lot of people don't use spices in their cooking. It's just salt and pepper. Um, but spices, I consider spices our best friends uh, with cooking and food and digestion because they're very, they're not only very dense nutrients, but um, they're also very good to help you digest the food and of course make the food more flavorful as well. So um, are you spice deficient? If, you're, if you feel very tired after a meal, you might be spice deficient or maybe you ate too much, you know, when, when you eat and you just feel like all your energy is gone and you need to take a nap and you can't focus on doing anything. It means you just, maybe you ate too much or your digestive fire is too low. You need spices to up that. Um, you may feel bloated or gassy. So all these digestive reactions could be a symptom of spice deficiency. Um, different spices can also, well, there are different spices that help us digest different foods, especially, for example, cardamom helps digest protein. So I use both green cardamom and black cardamom. So the green cardamom is great for like sweet, like any dairy dishes or um, any, any sweet things. Uh, black cardamom is really good with lentils and like, also dairy, like if I make a cheese dish, savory cheese dish, I would use black cardamom because it really helps digest protein. Um, and also, of course, all these, all the sour, like lime juice, fresh tamarind, these are all good for protein digestion. And then of course, cinnamon, you speak so much about cinnamon. 
and, and also fenugreek, very good for sugar, uh, metabolism, digestion. So, so people are like, yeah, I like to add cinnamon to my pie. It's not just for flavor. I mean, the flavor is great, but it also helps you digest the sugars. So mm -hmm. there's so much to learn about different, just the spices alone. Yeah, no, I think that would be your third book should be something about, you know, the magic of spices and what they do with all of them individually and, and how to re-educate people how to use them. I think that would be incredibly valuable. What spice for this kind of a thing? You mentioned cheese, which is also sort of a controversial, not in Ayurveda, not so controversial maybe, but I'm curious your take on cheese and what kind of cheese is okay and what would you eat it with? How, what's you talk about? Let's talk about cheese for a bit. Yeah, I mean, first of all, dairy, the cheese comes from, it, just not all dairy is the same. You speak a lot about that in your articles. So selecting the best quality dairy from um, um, grass-fed, organic, and my idea of dairy also comes from cows that will never be killed. It's called ahimsa, like non-violence dairy. And there are such farms. The dairy is super expensive and very rare to find, but they are. Uh, because when the cows are happy, they produce, the milk is so much more nutritious and anything that you transform that milk into will be a lot more, will make you happy. Um, but that's rare. So um, the fermented cheeses are the ones that are really not recommended. I stopped eating them a long time ago. So uh, cheddar cheese and what is it, pepper jack and, oh, blue cheese, oh my God. <laughs> it smells like, ooh. But Why do these things that are so hard to digest taste like, so good? I mean, I saw one author calls them rotten milk and I'm like, yeah, I guess, I mean, there is mold in it, so, but, um, so fresh cheeses, make, when you curdle the milk and make fresh paneer cheese, um, that's, that's much, much easier to digest because the fermentation just makes it and all the mold that grows in it, it's just, it's hard to digest. So I'm so, curious about that. If we could dig into that a little bit, cause I mean, obviously if you go to Bulgaria and Switzerland and the Alps, you know, if they didn't have cows, you know, roaming and make cheese for the winter, rub it with salt from the salt mines that they had. The, the, there would be no one living in the Alps. I mean, you couldn't, that was the only way to make it there. So how is it that those folks seem to thrive in an environment, um, you know, where well, they have to make these hard cheeses? Maybe there's one thing you don't know about me, but I come from a, a family of um, dairy producers. So my grandparents in Bulgaria, they lived in the mountains very isolated in the mountains, very steep like hills. And they had like 150 sheep and five cows and so many goats. And they would milk all these animals by hand <laughs> twice a day, <laughs> my grandfather and grandmother. So every summer, winter, like I spent countless uh, days and, and seasons with them growing up and watching them how they produce dairy. So I watched yeah. my grandmother make yogurt. I learned how to make yogurt from her and I love making yogurt. I watched her and then using different types of milk, I watched her make fre fresh cheese. So, um, and she would make different types of cheese and using also different types of uh, what you call it, uh, culture to make the cheese, different colors. And um, I was always fascinated of how this works. And I still, the fresh cheese that she made was my favorite um, because it just it felt so soft and not too salty and things like that. But yes, also it's different altitude there. You know, like I, I saw them also what they did in the winter because they were really eating locally and they would cut the wool from the sheep and she would, make her own wool and then she would make sweaters and socks for us like that's how i grew up being around that so beautiful and, yeah it is and and she would make the fresh bread and the whole house would smell like that but um yes yeah, so during the winter we would live off 
like canned vegetables, like preserves and things that you would make during the summer. And then the cheese, uh, there was less milk in the winter also. Uh, so I think it's important. See, Ayurveda is all about adapting to your time, place, and circumstance. So eating local means also considering the geographic location that you're in, the climate, um, and what, what's the environment you're in, and then adjusting your diet according to that to support you being in balance and healthy in that particular environment. Do you think that, you know, we know that in the, Ayurvedically, we know that in the winter, the digestive system is stronger. Mm -hmm. um, there's, I've written some articles about the science behind that. So obviously, if you're going to eat hard cheese, you need to have a much stronger digestion. And I wonder in those cold, cold environments where they're really out there in the cold, milking and everything that they do, that they have a strong enough digestive system because they've made these dramatic shifts from seasonal eating from, you know, we know that, you know, grains are harvested in the fall. We know amylase, which digests those grains, increases in our body in the fall when they're harvested. And the digestive strength increases in the winter when we have these hard cheese that are preserved, uh, these more fermented foods, vegetables that were fermented to last them through the winter months. You know, I wonder if that was part of the, 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 the living in sync with those natural cycles in, 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 in trained with your environment, your geographical environment, you know, and made that seemingly okay when you eat it grass fed, you know. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But also you have to understand the lifestyle. They were not sitting in front of the TV all the time. <laughs> no. They were working hard, like, physical work <laughs> you yeah. get hungry <laughs> yeah do that and and also being out in nature all the time like yeah. we would chop the wood and and uh, we cook the food on a wood stove you know and yeah, we had oh boy. Crispy, of course but then the, you were able to just turn the button huh no to get the heat <laughs> so everything it like like everything was like we, like living in those environments you're so connected to nature first of all, and then yeah. you're so, because you're making most of the things yourself, especially if you live in more, more related areas. So yeah, you, like they were strong. I mean, I would never, I could never imagine how they could carry all this hay and all that down the hill on their backs. It's like, they, they were strong. So it living was, uh, in that environment gives you energy to digest heavy foods. Yeah, I, I, I agree. We, we did a, um, a, uh, a trip, my wife and I, we did it called it the cheese tour many years ago and went all around Europe to just really understand the, the cheese. Because I was fascinated by that idea because Ayurveda says cheese is so bad. And I wanted to see if, what the original cheese was and, the, and how they made it in these original places. And we searched high and low, went to places in Norway where they make this cheese where they would wrap up milk and a dirty sock and put it under the barn for six months and pull it out they called it gamma lost and it was hairy when it came out it was hairy and unbelievable it was they called it viking cheese and and uh and ended up going finding this this uh malga up in the dolomites where um they were right on the border of austria and they they made what they called sour kaisa sour kaisa which was sour cheese which was pretty much identical to how we make paneer which is just take milk and and heat it up and then put it in the cheesecloth, add a little lemon, and it naturally curdles. And that's what they would do. They would take the milk and they'd put it in a pan and out in the front step and they would let it sit there, maybe add something sour to it, and it would curdle. And that was the, one of the original, it was hard to find it because everybody's so modernized, but when we found it, it was, the, one, it was the original cheese in Austria called sour quesa, which was so similar to the Ayurvedic um, cheese, you know, paneer, which was done in a beautiful way. So that, tradition even existed there. And then of course, when I think when they found the salt mines, they figured out they could rub it with salt. Uh, well, then it would last for the whole winter and you know, yeah. that got a little bit easier for them. Anyway, fascinating. Let's talk a minute before we close and I know I could talk to you all day. I wanna to talk to you about seasonal eating a little bit, something I'm really um, um, interested in and write a lot about. I know that you're really into that as well. And uh, talk to me about, about, about that and, and uh, just anything you can share in that in that world of seasonal eating and the importance of it. 
Yeah, so seasonal is, uh, of course, seasonal ingredients. So uh, what what's available in the market? Going to the farmer's market is is very, it's perhaps the easiest thing to understand. Okay, that's in season right now, it's available now. Uh, but also seasonal in terms of um, adjusting your meals to, um, like for example, to, to balance with the environment. So you speak in your, I love your three season diet book. I, I really love that book. And you speak about how in the winter we need more fat and protein. We need to, to balance with the cold, cold temperatures. Uh, and we also, they're heavier, so they keep us more grounded. Um, in the summer, uh, we need more carbohydrates because they, they help us have more energy as we're more active in the summer. So, and all the fruits and they come, they're seasonal in the summer, they, they give us that. So that's one thing, but also eating. So in the winter, we need more warming foods and spices. So I would always use extra ginger, maybe a little bit of chili. I Sometimes I they tend to be very high pitta. When I'm not, I would use a little bit of green chili um, because I need that fire, I need that heat. I would use more warming spices in the winter. And then in the, in the summer, I would, I would use more cooling spices and more uh, cooling ingredients. Like I would cook more with coconut oil in the summer, not so much in the winter, because coconut oil is very cooling by nature. So also so, considering the properties of food, not just the, not just the local ingredients, but also the, the qualities. Is it heating? Is it cooling? like that, the, the strength, the potency. Uh, and the other thing that, that comes up always constantly is the, you know, the argument over saturated fats, you know, coconut oil and ghee or saturated fats. And, and the, the, you know, so the American Heart Association is in heavily against them. Um, where I in Ayurvedic medicine, we make the case that, that um, they're actually, you know, very, very good for us. Have you dug into that a little bit or, or have any understanding of why they can be okay when, you know, it is controversial, but there's a lot of, you know, studies and science saying they're not. Yeah, well, the importance is, you speak about this a lot, is to, to be, like the ghee, uh, it's a short chain fat. It breaks down very quickly. Um, and we need to have good fats. I mean, we, our brain needs it, our cells <laughs> need it, but the fats have to be easier to digest. That's the thing is that the longer the, ch the chain of the fat is, the, the harder it is to break it down. So um, I personally, I only use really four types of oil in my cooking. My favorite is cultured ghee by, by all means. Right. Not only because it's, uh, yeah, it really, I just watched your video, the um, Ayurvedic tea for immunity that you just yeah. read. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. About ghee and how important it is to he for healing the lining of the gut and, and all that. So ghee is also very tasty. You know, it gives you the taste of butter, but it's not heavy, especially the cultured ghee. And mm -hmm. then... What I notice also is that when you cook in ghee, and you don't have to use a lot, you use a little bit, it satiates you with less amount of food. So that's another way to eat less and not to overeat. You just feel food full faster. Right. But you don't I think that's a, a great, I never thought of it that way, but, but you know, ghee is, as you know, it's an anupan, right? It, when you take it, it helps deliver the nutrition across the intestinal wall. And it also, fats tend to slow down the absorption. So, I mean, that's what the whole Bulletproof coffee thing is about. You take yeah, your yeah, coffee yeah. and you put ghee in it and blend it. And now the coffee doesn't give you this spike and crash you. It gives you kind of a steady kind of IV drip of caffeine all, all day long. I'm not a big fan of caffeine. Uh, we're definitely not all day long. But that's what, the, that's what it does. And But when you take it with your food, and that exactly what you said is delivering that nutrition through, mm -hmm. throughout a longer period of time. So a lot less food, of course, if you eat it slowly, um, will <laughs> satiate you and then give you the ability to make that food last for a longer period of time. 
which is exactly why like in our cleanses, right, with our ghee cleanses, you take the ghee in the morning and then you'll, you know, if you take a decent amount of ghee, most people are like, uh, I don't, I couldn't eat anything if I wanted to eat anything right now. So there, you know, now you're already flipping into fat burning, which is a stable source of fuel. So yeah, I, I love that. I never really thought about cooking with ghee, delivering the same exact concept of making you have more energy with less food. And that is the name of the game. Calorie restriction, eating less in America is, is one of the most important principles you know, we can have. A little bit of starvation uh, is well-documented. Nobel Prize winning science to support longevity and health for sure. Yeah, I mean, and you know, you don't, I, I always, I very much appreciate your science. I don't have the scientific brain so much. So like, even if you're not science oriented, if you just, you can just try it for yourself and cook with ghee and just see how you feel, you know, like see how, just notice how that you need less food, that you're satiated with less food. And, and then it's also very enjoyable. That's what I love about Ayurvedic cooking. It's healthy, but it's also delicious and it's enjoyable. You don't have to force yourself to eat it. it it's like, yes, I want to eat like that. And, and mm. I always, that's my passion is to help people support, to help support people to eat like that and feel better and enjoy it in the process. Well, I can tell you that, you know, the, the, the crowds of people and your restaurant's not massive, but I mean, it was just one group of after another group of people just in the staff were so, they were so honored to be a part of working for you and, and being a part of delivering this food. It, it, it was like a restaurant I've never, nothing like anything I've ever seen or been in before. Um, it was, you could really feel, palpate, the, the quality of the food and, the, and the, the joy and the enthusiasm that everybody had that was working for you. Um, and then when you look at the menu and hear about everything that's made from scratch and you just can't get that anymore anywhere unless you go back to Bulgaria and go back to your grandma's and grandpa's farm. It, it doesn't exist and it does exist in New York at Divya's Kitchen. So I really want you all to know about that. Stay in touch with Divya. Divya, how can folks get a hold of you and stay in touch with you? Well, well, maybe Instagram is the easiest way to okay. follow us. My personal Instagram is Divya Alter. Our restaurant, which is even more active, is Divya's Kitchen NYC. Our school is BVT Life. Uh, we're working actually on, um, on an, the first level for our culinary training, Ayurvedic culinary training. We're kind of breaking it up and making it more accessible. So we're creating the first level to be taught online, especially in this current situation. Because the people from all over the world who are like, I want to study with you, but I live in South Korea. <laughs> yeah. So we'll, if you follow us, we will be announcing very soon our online training. And um, come visit us to New York. That will be the best part because then then I get to see to meet you in person. Yeah, I would love that. I, I'm, I definitely, I, there's no question in my mind that every time I'm in New York, I know exactly one thing I will do, which is go visit you and have a meal at your restaurant. There's no doubt about that. I also think that um, if you go to that, her restaurant and eat her food, and then you realize you can get certified to actually cook like that, and open a restaurant in your little town with these principles. I mean, is the, I mean, I just feel like I was telling my kids that night, like you should all become cooks and open restaurants because we have six kids, right? And they all, they all have jobs and stuff, but you know, a lot of them are still trying to figure that out. A couple of them, um, like this, like it would be an instant success. Of course, now they close all the restaurants now, so it's a little scary to open a restaurant. But I, but I do think that the, the knowledge um, is indelible. It's something that learning how to cook like this is something that everybody should have. So if it's online, you know, let me know. We'll support you 100% and get folks your way. And I think a lot of our folks would love, love, love to learn this next step. So we'll do everything we can to help you there. So keep in touch, okay? And thank yes. you so much for what you're doing. Thank, and good luck with the rest of this coronavirus. I hope that you guys fare well and get back in business and start serving 
people that amazing food once again. So really, thanks for coming, and we'll stay in touch and stay connected. Okay, Divya? Thank you so much, Dr. John. Cool. Yeah, good luck with everything you're doing. Thanks for speaking with you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Do you like this video? Don't forget to subscribe and share. This recording is brought to you by LifeSpa, where ancient Ayurvedic wisdom meets modern science. Get access to free health video newsletters by Dr. John at LifeSpa.com. These statements have not been evaluated by the FDA. These products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease.